know, when Pastor Luke first approached me about uh, speaking on Father's Day, hmm, my first thought was, they didn't even call me. The other guys he's tried to get to do this didn't even let me know he was coming. Could have given me a heads up, and I could have said no also. What do you think, John, number six, number seven? Where was I at down the list? He was really just trying to get out of town, wasn't he? But, you know, initially I said no. Uh, no, thank you. I appreciate it. it. And it's not that I had any reservations about doing it. It's just that I respect this position so much that I just sometimes feel I'm not worthy to give out words. You know, I just feel like, you know, you just, it's too much involved. It's too many responsibilities because you guys are so important to God and so important to me. So I just felt like, well, maybe that's a tough gig. No, but God told me, well, but you have the Holy Spirit inside you, right? You don't really have to say much at all. Just let me talk. So then that means I have to get in the Word so I can say the right things to you, right? So I felt better about it, as I do now. So that's pretty good, too. So anyway, I felt like I was uh, <laughs> being sent to the principal office when I told him no. And he, he, he told me, he said, well, pray about it. Who says that? Because you know the moment you pray about it, it's like God saying, come talk to me. So you already know you're done. So just, just decide you're going to do it and be done with it. Okay. So I want to first thank all the men here today who are fathers. Thank you for being fathers. Give them a hand. Thank you very much. And all you young men, keep your eye on these guys here because these guys are good examples. And it's always good to have good examples. So I didn't know what I was going to talk about. I, uh, maybe I wrote maybe two different messages thinking I would talk about, and maybe something warm and fuzzy, maybe, you know, because they're always doing Mother's Day, so maybe I should come up with something really good. You know, my wife got tired of listening to me, <laughs> talking to myself in another room while she's trying to sleep. But it wasn't until I finally said, okay, God, what do you want to talk about? What do you want? Because that's what I should have done in the beginning. I should have just asked him what he wanted to talk about. And he said to me, the family, have you guys noticed or is it just me? that it's like turmoil out here. It's like everything's going crazy right now. I mean, there's things, it's all a distraction, of course, but nonetheless, it's out there. You know, we got our kids battling whether or not they, what sex they really are. I mean, we got absentee fathers. We've got, you know, mothers buck, bucking the, the, the system. We, I mean, there's so many things going on out here right now. We even got racism. They talk about racism like it's a color thing, and it really, it's a mindset, it's a person thing, you know. It's everybody, anybody who feels different, weird about somebody else and wants to express it, I mean, not treat you like you should be treated, well, that could be called racism. But it's all out here right now. So, in preparing for this message, what I did was, God took me on a little trip. So see, I worked downtown at the VA. So God took me and detoured a couple of times down there. So I turned on this street and turned on that street, and next, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of all these tents. People sleeping on the ground, living in trash. And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what's, what's this all about, what he's trying to show me. And so I get my own thought in my mind. I'm thinking, you know, okay, that's good. So I go on to work. Next day, he does the same thing, detour a different direction. Tents, nothing but tents, and people laying on the floor, laying in the ground in the grass and trash, and there's trash and children even with them. Wow. Kind of threw me for a minute. But then God asked me, what do you see? And I said, well, I mean, I see people that have made bad choices. Really? So I asked the question over Facebook forum. I belong to one of these men of Christ deals. So I asked that, them, and I asked some of my Christian friends, some of my non-Christian friends, uh, some of my coworkers. And it amazes me that, did you know Joe Biden is the reason why these people are out the street? <laughs> no, Vice President Kamala. It's her fault. Donald Trump, the government. DHS system. All of these people are responsible for these people being out in the street. And God said, really? Hmm. What do all these people have in common? They're people. They come from family. So we have to look at the structure of the family to figure out why these people are where they're at. Because the one thing that I realized dealing with these folks is that they've given up. You know, they've given up on whether anything positive or good can happen for them, they've given up. You know, we hit the streets, oh, I don't know, was it maybe three, four, maybe a month ago with a 
good minister friend of mine and his family, we decided we'd take some care packages out. Well, we took these care packages out and we hand them out, different ones. And, and you know, on occasion, we have one guy that would, would say, well, I don't need it. Give it to somebody who needs to already have one and it'd be good. Okay. The one thing that they never, ever rejected was prayer. Anytime we said, can we pray for you? They were like, yeah, let's do that. So they, you know, God reminded me of that. So that got me to thinking, okay, so maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Hmm, okay. Well, God said that he has a plan for us all. Jeremiah 29, 11, right? That's our favorite stable for that. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. I'm saying, wow. So these guys, what, do they not have the same plan? I believe, I believe God developed the family so that he could show us how to love one another, how we should live with him, how we should live in him. You know, he paralleled it to his love for the church. So I figured that must have been important. First Corinthians 11.3 says that, but I would have you know that you're the head of every man in Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is the church. So is God. So God set up this family and he constructed it so, so that we could see the order that he wanted to bless us. And he goes on to say that what is expected of the wife. Now, when I first went to put this in here, I, you know, I could hear my wife in the background saying that, submit? <laughs> Ephesians 5.22 says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. So, yeah, and I don't blame you guys. I, that'd be a hard pill for me to swallow too. Submit. Hmm. But we always miss the last part of that, as unto the Lord. So I had to liken this, look at this as, as an example, um, buying a car. I had a friend of mine that was needing to buy a vehicle, didn't have the credit for it. John, he was in the finance office trying to buy a car, and they said, you don't have the credit for this. So what he did was he called up his parents, and unfortunately, they co-signed for him. The finance company no longer looks at him. They look at the parents because that's where the credit's been coming from. So this morning, I want to ask you ladies, don't look at us, God's co-signing on this loan. So if we truly say that this is God's word, we trust it to be God's word, we trust that everything God says in his word is true, then if he says this, then, I mean, we either do it or we don't, right? That was the hard part. The easy part of this whole thing is God's never going to fail. You can cash those chips in all day long. I guarantee you, he's good for it. Now, guys, we're going to have a conversation this morning. I want to get all out of the way so we can talk. Pretend like there's nobody here but us. All right. So what does that mean for us, guys? If we're the head of the home, and God has called the wife to submit herself unto us as unto the Lord, what does that mean for us? Lots of responsibility. So what is our role, actually? God has made the man the priest of the home. You know, when I normally think of priest, I think of praying, right? Absolutely. Pray for your family. We are to pray for our family. And I'm going to go a step further and say that we should pray out loud for our family. Babe, can you come here for a second? I know you, that's why, yes or no? Right? I know, right? There's two reasons why you should pray out loud. When you, one is so the enemy can hear it, and two is so she can hear it. Because there's nothing more fortifying than knowing that someone is praying for you and knows your needs and praying exactly for your needs. So you should pray even for your kids for their each individual need. It tells them how much you love them, because if you love them, you'll know. And you pray for those things, right? So you should never be afraid to pray out loud anyway. My wife knows this is my thing. <laughs> Isn't that right? So, precious Father, I thank you so much for this wonderful woman that you blessed me with. I thank you for the heart that she has for you, Father. I ask that you'll continue to raise her, Father, continue to grow up. 
I pray that you will make me the man I need to be, that you will continue to make me the Christian you need to be. And that I'll always do what I need to do for her. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You should be able to do that without even thinking. Guys, when we don't pray for our kids and pray for our family, we send our family outside that door with no covering. Imagine that. We know what's going on out here. So instead of praying a protection around them, we pretty much say, go fend for yourself. Call me if you need anything. Right? That's not how God planned it. We're to teach our family. I know you guys love him. I do too. It is not Luke's job. Teach your family. That's yours. That's your job to get in God's word and seek him out and teach your family. That's where that spiritual respect comes from. You teaching your family. We are to provide and protect our family. And that doesn't mean me pulling out my 10 millimeter and running on the street off somebody because they call my wife some crazy name. You know? Although I'll do it. <laughs> what it means is that I am supposed to know her and know what we're dealing with so I can pray directly at that thing or whatever that process is, I need to be able to do that. I need to make sure she's covered every day and every night. You can ask my wife. I'm not bragging on myself, kind of, sort of. Every morning, except this morning, baby, I apologize. I was so nervous. There's not a morning I don't go to work that I don't lay my hands on my wife and pray for her and for her day. It's important. Only God can protect her the way she needs to be protected. And I know she hates it, but I wake her up for it. Because I want her to hear my voice. I want her to hear and know that it's me praying for her. So I pray for her every morning. On occasion when I, God feels like that's not enough, he'll sit me down in the prayer room and I'll write a note. I'll see you stick it on the bathroom mirror. I'll just stick it on that coffee. Because I know she's not going to pass that coffee up. So I'll stick it on the coffee maker. But I never put it on a purse. So she'll never find it there. But <clears throat> because I want her to know that I'm doing what God wants me to do. So I want her to have that security of knowing that when she goes out, that she has a covering. First Corinthians 11.3. Well, we're supposed to spend time with God, and that's what we said earlier. We seek his advice on everything. You know, we're not supposed to know everything, but God does know everything. And there's nothing that you need or that you can't find in God's word. And I think that's why he says, search him out as hidden treasure. You know, some things on the surface, some things you've got to dig for. But your family is worth digging it for, I'm sure. Godly example. Hmm. And what does that entail? If we follow God's commandments, if we do what God's asking us to do, uh, if we hang around the right people, people that are spiritual-minded or just like us, or we're from the same cloth, then you tend to check and balance one another, and you tend to, you know, do the right thing. As a matter of fact, I'm not, I never come into question because I'm hanging around the wrong people at my job, and that's when, you know. But I'm good about it. You guys don't have to work with me. I'm good. The ultimate charge for the husband is to love his wife as well, the same way Christ loves the church. Now, there's a word for us. We confuse that one. I love oatmeal raisin cookies. Do I not? I love oatmeal filled cookies. You know the ones with the cream in them, the, in the little package? Love them. Ask my wife how much I love them. I'll even take them to bed with me. Well, I not? I may not finish them all, but I'll take them. But that's a different kind of love than what this is talking about. You know, Christ loved us so much that he gave his life for us. Wow. That's love. We're to have that same love, the exact same love. We're supposed to have that for our family, for our wives. Because they say the thing that you love, you'll take care of. God's plan. Benefits of that plan. Because, you know, we talk about following God's plan, but then sometimes we have to be told, well, why? You know, I went to the Air Force. And I tell people all day long, you know, the Army and the Marine guys, they say, hey, look, hit that beach, get her done. And those guys don't ask one question. They just go do it. Air Force? No. 
we say, well, why? We don't mind doing it. We just want to know why. You know, we're a little smarter than that. We'll still go do it. We just want to know why. So as we said about Jeremiah 11 and 29 11, God does have a plan for us. And when we follow God's plan, we're guaranteed to live the best life possible that God has for us. When we follow God's plan, we become the best witness of Christian life. When we follow God's plan, we can see the depth of his love for us. When we follow God's plan, it eliminates stress and worry because the responsibility then is not on him and not on us. See, we step out from under that umbrella of protection and it's pretty much on us now. When God says, if you just do what I say, you just follow me. I got it. Everything's good. You know, I'll tell you, I pondered a thought. I'm going to let you guys help me with it this morning. You know, I was looking at those people in those tents out there and laying on the ground, and I got to thinking to myself, wow, the enemy is rampant, man. This dude is going crazy. I mean, he's really trying to kill, steal, and destroy, right? Huh. Don't place a thought in your head. So, if I believe this, be the word of God, and everything in it to be right. He's never failed me. Everything he said has been true. He's been a great example. Everything in here. So then if God tells me to do something and I say, well, I'm going to do what I want to do, then is the enemy doing that? Or is it me? See, I don't think the enemy has the power to uproot God's plan. I don't think he does. See, what God did was he gave us a will. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm going to lay this out for you, though, this plan, but then you can decide whether you want to follow it or not. But then when that happens, you decide, well, I'm going to go on my own path. We tend to want to say, well, it's the devil, right? Any of you guys old enough remember Flip Wilson? Remember the devil made me do it? Remember that old commercial with this guy wearing a red pajamas and a long tail and a pitchfork? The world has taken and desensitized the devil for us. So that even to say that word sometimes make you feel like you're talking about a fantasy. He's real. He really is. He's deceptive. But he doesn't make you do anything. So if you decide for some reason, oh, I'm not going to pray for my wife this morning. I'm not going to correct my child in this area where she's at or he's at. You know, it's not the enemy that's good. It's, it's you. We've got to start, stop placing the blame in the wrong areas. So now you can disagree with that if you want. That's okay. I'm all right with that. So look, so I was looking for examples. And I know there are great men in here. And for what I know, you guys, you're really great. You really are. And, um, but the Bible said that we should also, you know, we can look at animals, wildlife, insects, bees, and see God working. See his ultimate word living out. So I was trying to figure out, wow, a good father figure. You know, the first thought comes to mind is that mighty lion. Boy, isn't he awesome? Not really. This dude sits around all day long doing nothing. In the shade and the heat on occasion, he'll get up and belch and walk over to some seat and lay back down again. While his wife or his pride, the lionesses, will go out and hunt. They go out and get the game for him and they bring it back. And guess what? He's the first one to eat. Even before the children, he eats first. Now, the only time this guy gets upset is when something threatens his family. But is it his family he's upset about? No, it's his way of life. He gets upset because, okay, so now somebody's disrupted my plan. I can't lay here and wait on food because you're disturbing stuff. That's why he does what he does. So he's not really a good example. Imperial penguin, that's my guy. The imperial penguin. Now, the imperial penguin are some of the most dedicated animal fathers in the world. By the time the mother lays her egg, she's expended so much energy and nutritional reserves that she has to go for two months out to sea to feed, just to replenish herself. Maternity leave. <laughs> it's only two months, ladies. <laughs> and I don't recommend all the eating. But she has to do this just to get her strength and everything back. So now while she's gone, the father takes the egg and places it on top of his feet 
and nestled against his stomach so it stays warm, shielding it from the Arctic winds. Because if the wind blows on him, the Arctic winds, the chick won't make it. He doesn't move. He stands there. He doesn't eat two months. Protecting this chick. My mom's gone. Now, if mom doesn't get back before the, the chick hatches, well, now dad does his thing. He said, well, gee, I guess mom's not here. I got to take care of it. So he feeds. He gives of himself. He feeds the chick from his milk from his esophagus. Takes care of this child until his mom gets back. Wow. He got my vote for father of the year, that's for sure. I don't know too many of us who will feed anything from our esophagus, but <laughs> or anybody that would take it, Bill. I don't know. Uh, I told my wife I wouldn't keep y'all long today. She knows how I get uh, a little carried away when I get to talk. See, uh, I asked my wife at the very beginning, I said, babe, I need you to do me a favor. You know how I like to change thoughts because God is always in my head working. So I, I'll consider that we're through with the conversation and then I'll start on another one, although you're still in that conversation. But I'm going somewhere else. We call that rabbit, right? So I said to her, babe, if I start to do that, here's the sign. Jason, rabbit. So I was going <laughs> to have to make fun of her if she does that, but I guess I did all right, yes? I didn't chase any? Good, thank you. I appreciate that because I really felt weird doing that. You know, man, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I really think Satan thinks that, that we're stupid. I really think that he just doesn't get it because he's placing bets. I bet you he's, he's betting that we're, that we're too busy for God. In a lot of cases, sometimes it seems like that because instead of doing what God wants to do, we do what we want to do. So it seems like we're too busy. Yeah, I think he's betting on the fact that our arrogance will convince us that we have plenty of time. You ever go that route? I did before. Go plenty of time. I got plenty of time. I'll take care of that later. I'll get that. We will start a study next week, I promise you. Delayed obedience is disobedience. If God's telling me we need to do this, we need to do it now. And he knows, because he sees the big picture, so he knows. I think sometimes he's betting that we don't trust God's plan. Because really, indeed, if we trust that God has a plan for us, and we've seen the strike where we know how good he is at what he does, you think we just follow it, right? But the main thing is that the enemy doesn't know how much he affects us until he sees our actions. He's not like God. He's not everywhere. He can't read minds. He can't do any of these things. He doesn't have that kind of power. But he can suggest things. And the moment you act on those things, he knows he's affected. Now, I don't want to keep, I want to close with this one deal today. I want to, um, first of all, I want to say this. In all my life going to church, the one thing that we were always assured of is that when you got to church, it would be four to one at least, women to men. Somebody getting it. Normally the women are getting it because they understand. You know, it's nothing like a praying woman to God, you know. I mean, heart's always in the right place when it comes to servitude. So I'm going to ask this morning, and I know it's not the norm, but I, I would like to cover the men this morning. But I would like the ladies to help me do that. Because nobody prays like a godly woman. So this is what I want to do. On Tuesday nights, we do prayer meeting, and we're pretty. We don't care what we sound like when we pray. We just want to talk to God. So I want the ladies to help me talk to God this morning for us because we need it this morning. There's a lot of things going on. The man needs to be placed back in his God-given role in the family, and we got a lot of opposition, mainly against ourselves. I think a lot of times we don't see the importance of that, but there's a great importance to that. So I'm going to ask if, uh, if I can get the women to stand for me. Those of you that want to stand, can stand. Please stand. 
And I'm going to ask that in any direction that there's a guy, there's a man in this thing that you would extend your hands. I'm going to ask also that, like we do at prayer meeting, that you lead off. I'm going to have my sister, Leslie Click, lead off for us. And as God leads you, when she ends this kind of praying, and I'll close this out, okay? But I want her to start for us this morning. Just pray something for our men this morning, okay? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to read your message this morning. It seemed that everything that I myself thought I needed to talk about, you had other things in plan, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm always okay with that. You have a design to restore the family. You have a design to protect us and provide for us. Father, I too pray for the men in this church, Father, that uh, and you'll make them warriors. That you'll make them prayer warriors. That you would protect their homes, their families. You continue to teach them how to love, how to care for their wives and their families. I pray that you will keep them sharp in their minds and their eyes, that they'll notice everything that goes on in their home and, and they'll be protected. The Bible says the enemy comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. He has no good thoughts in mind at all for us. I ask that you would help these men to get deeper into your word. I pray that you would give them knowledge, that you give them wisdom, and give them understanding. I pray that they will be the husbands that they need to be for their wives and uh, the priests of their home. I pray that after today that uh, they'll pray for their family, that they'll spend time on their knees for their family. I pray that they'll understand the importance of their role as the fathers ahead of the home. Be 
you have been nothing but a blessing, Father. Seeing that we really just don't deserve your son dying on the cross for us. We're so grateful for the opportunity, Father, to be witnesses for you and for the kingdom. I ask these things and many other things your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Ladies, thank you. I guess that's going to get it for me. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys today. And I took John's advice. I kept it short. I tried to stay on point. You know, as usual, you know, God has his ideas too. And I learned to go by his instead of mine anymore. So, yeah. So, um, I don't know what you guys are doing for Father's Day, but I pray that you'll have a good one. Enjoy yourselves. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you.